Traumatic brain injury is a big problem worldwide with over 27 million cases and TBI largely affects young people. If the brain injury is severe, 50% of people die and of those that survive, about two thirds will be left with lifelong disability. Different causes of traumatic brain injury. Falling is common, also motor vehicle accidents, sporting injuries and assaults. People who have severe TBI are at higher risk of developing secondary brain injury while in hospital and this occurs in 55% of patients with a severe TBI. The complications that may result in secondary brain injury are inflammatory brain edema, a bleed in the brain, hydrocephalus caused by a blockage in the brain ventricular system, vasospasm of a major cerebral artery, and low blood pressure in the setting of traumatic injuries elsewhere in the body. The first three result in swelling of the brain and raised intracranial pressure, and all five complications result in reduced cerebral blood flow and ultimately brain hypoxia. Brain hypoxia is a major problem. Within 10 minutes of insufficient oxygen, brain cells are dead. Early detection and treatment of brain hypoxia is therefore crucial to prevent irreversible brain injury. Current options to monitor brain oxygen levels are problematic. There are three options available. The first is physical examination. However, examination can only detect brain hypoxia late as it depends on finding a physical disability. Another problem of physical examination is that it's done intermittently. The second option is invasive monitoring of intracranial pressure or brain oxygen levels. This has limitations. You have to drill a hole in the skull. The patients are therefore at risk of complications such as bleeding and infection. Thirdly, a non-invasive option called a cerebral oximeter. However, over 30 years of clinical use and clinical trials have not shown cerebral oximeters to provide accurate data. Our monitor does not have the shortcomings of those other options. Our monitor is non-invasive. It can be put on patients from the time of injury when the ambulance arrives and provides a continuous monitoring of brain oxygen levels until the patient is discharged from hospital. Being non-invasive, it doesn't have the risks associated with invasive options. Our data suggests it may work, unlike cerebral oximeters, which haven't been shown to be of clinical use in severe TBI. The brain pulse oximeter was assessed in a sheep model of acute brain injury. Eight sheep were studied. The monitor is quite different from existing cerebral oximeters and it uses the principles of pulse oximetry to detect both the pulse of blood and also to measure oxygen levels in the brain. On the sheep, we had our brain pulse oximeter and also a skin pulse oximeter. These were continuously measuring the optical signals. The skin oximeter was also used because with existing cerebral oximeters, one of the major sources of error is contamination of the optical signal by blood flow and blood oxygen levels in the skin. We wanted to assess whether following the brain injury, the shape of the waveform and oxygen levels were different in the brain and skin. The injury to the brain was produced by drilling a hole in the skull and by injecting 6 ml of blood directly into the base of the anterior cranial vault. This causes a marked increase in intracranial pressure and reduction in cerebral perfusion pressure. This injection was repeated 5 times in each sheep. This figure demonstrates a simultaneous recording of the normal brain waveform and the skin pulse waveform. As you can see, the shape of the brain pulse waveform is quite different to that of the skin. In fact, it is very much like a central venous pressure waveform with similar timing of the peaks and troughs. This figure demonstrates the changes in brain oxygen levels prior to the injection of blood, i.e. is normal. The green lines represent each cardiac cycle. The top panel shows the brain oxygen levels and how they change during a cardiac cycle. The bottom panel shows the simultaneous changes in the brain pulse waveform which allows the systolic and diastolic phases to be determined. What we can see is that during systole the brain oxygen levels go up to around 100% but thereafter they fall and by the end of diastole they have fallen to around 70%. This is consistent with the optical signal arising from blood predominantly in the brain microcirculation. This figure represents our findings when we had injected three rounds of blood. This data is the average from seven animals. By the third injection, a total of 80 ml had been injected into the brain. The upper panel demonstrates the changes in the intracranial pressure, blood pressure, and the cerebral perfusion pressure. The blood was injected into the anterior cranial vault at time zero. The ICP increased to 210 millimeters of mercury and consequently, the cerebral perfusion pressure fell dramatically. By 60 seconds, the ICP fell and the blood pressure increased to restore cerebral perfusion pressure. The second panel demonstrates the changes in brain and skin oximeter oxygen levels. Over the 30 seconds following the injection, oxygen levels in the brain dropped. By 60 seconds, the oxygen levels in the brain increased dramatically, well beyond baseline levels. Thereafter, by around 150 seconds, the brain oxygen levels dropped again below baseline and thereafter gradually recovered. The initial fall in brain oxygen levels is consistent with a decrease in cerebral perfusion due to the increased intracranial pressure. The subsequent increase in brain oxygen levels is consistent with changes in cerebral blood flow as part of brain autoregulation to restore brain oxygen levels. This results from cerebral vasodilation and a systemic increase in blood pressure, which together can result in a brief period of cerebral hyperperfusion 
and very high brain oxygen levels. The subsequent forward around 150 seconds may also represent autoregulation and a reduction in cerebral blood flow to normalize brain oxygen levels. It is important to note that the skin oxygen levels remain largely unchanged throughout this period. The bottom panel shows the changes in the pulse amplitude of the brain and skin following the injection of blood. At 60 seconds, the pulse amplitude had increased dramatically compared to baseline levels, while the skin pulse amplitude levels did not change. This increase may represent an increase in cerebral blood flow due to cerebral vasodilation combined with increased blood pressure. It may also represent the increase in intracranial pressure forcing the brain closer to the skull and therefore more light from the sensor reaching the brain tissue. The final figure demonstrates some unusual changes we found in the brain pulse waveform typically following the blood injection. The brain pulse and skin pulse were measured simultaneously. During the period when the blood pressure was rising, the brain pulse waveform developed a high frequency oscillation at around 7 cycles per second or 7 hertz. This was not present in the skin pulse waveform. The 7 hertz oscillation waveform is very interesting because it is also seen with intracranial pressure monitoring of patients with severe TBI. It is believed to be due to movement or shaking of the brain in response to each high blood pressure systolic pulsation entering the brain. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.